Martial art is a shared journey driven by ancient and modern day principles as knowledge is handed down over time. The black belt is something that you become. It's not something that you get. In today's troubled and tense world, people look for ways to reach peace and contentment. For many, martial arts have been a wonderful way to achieve this and to learn about building oneself from the inside out. <coughs> Brian Mabel. There's something about the Colorado River and the Glenwood Canyon that it flows through that just takes your breath away. And as you cruise west along the engineering marvel of Interstate 70, you're drawn through the Rocky Mountains toward the city of Glenwood Springs in Garfield County, Colorado, about 150 miles west of Denver. Around Glenwood, natural and man-made sights and sounds combine to create a stunning setting for the just under 10,000 people who call it home and the countless tourists who come to visit. People pursue active lives here against a beautiful backdrop of nature on all sides, under a sky so big and so blue, you can get lost in time staring up at it. It's morning in Glenwood, and as the sun rises over Lookout Mountain and the moon sets and shadows retreat down Red Mountain, the city comes alive with streams of people moving in all directions to and through the area. Glenwood serves as a transportation hub for the region as people pass by on foot, wheel, water, rail, and air. And as you watch the flow of traffic across the Grand Avenue Bridge, you appreciate its role as an important link across the Colorado River joining Glenwood together and connecting it to places and people in all directions. Where Grand Avenue intersects on the other side with 8th Street defines the heart of this historical town. The California Zephyr arrives daily right into downtown. It brings people across the country in and out of Glenwood from California to Chicago. Those who know Glenwood know that for a town under five square miles, it packs a punch in personality and year-round activities. It's earned its place on countless national best-of lists, as a quick web search confirms. It's a haven, situated between Vail to the east and Aspen to the south and Grand Junction to the west, without their intensity. That's why people come here and why so many return. Grand Ave's like a main artery of a town located between three mountain ranges and two river systems. Glenwood's a gateway to the Roaring Fork Valley and all kinds of outdoor, athletic, intellectual and artistic pursuits. Originally called Defiance, this former mining town also made its mark in history, attracting the wealthy and famous, the infamous and the ailing to its hotels, rivers, mountains and hot springs. It's hosted Teddy Roosevelt and the Teddy Bear, Presidents Taft and Cleveland, Buffalo Bill Cody and Kit Carson, the infamous Doc Holliday shootout at 8th and Grand, and Al Capone and the gambling of Diamond Jim Brady. We came here to meet with Brian Mabel, a ninth degree black belt martial art master, originally from the East Coast U.S. with Ontario Canadian roots. We sat down with him in the Hotel Colorado in Glenwood, a place that evokes great old world charm. Over the past year, we've also gathered a lot of information and insight from interviews and casual chat with black belts and a grand master, and from filming Mr. Mabel and a group of his Glenwood students who turned out to show us what goes on in a martial arts studio and organization. As he showed us the sights and sounds of Glenwood, we learned more about what drives Mr. Mabel and what it is about martial art that can make a difference in life, beginning with why he came here, what made him stay, and how a chance opportunity changed a lifetime. Well, I originally came out in 1974 to go to school at a place called Colorado Mountain College here in town, and I was looking to get my associate's degree in recreation supervision. 
And so I did that, graduated in 1976, and I taught a women's self-defense class as uh, recommended by my recreation professor, and he asked if I could do that for extra credit, and I said I could do that. And that was uh, in 1975, I believe. And I enjoyed the teaching aspect of it so much that I asked the college if I could come back in the fall of 1976 and teach regular karate classes. And they said that would be great. And that brought me back. And, uh, and I've been teaching here uh, ever since. I taught through the college for 10 years before I started my own school in 1986. And uh, I didn't know what else to call it, so I called it Brian Mabel Karate, and, and, uh, and I've been here since then. Well, I started studying in 1981, and I kept hearing about Brian Mabel and his karate class. So I finally signed up at Colorado Mountain College to study karate with him. Just over a, a short period of time, I really developed a passion for not just karate, but Tong Soo Do, and teaching all those traditional values, really clean Tong Soo Do, something I think that kept a few of us in his class for a lifetime. If this was a uh, credited class, we'd have up towards 40, 45 people in some uh, semesters. And over the years, probably just touched hundreds of people throughout those classes. Some of the things I did after I graduated to get experience underneath my belt, since I have a degree in recreation, was to uh, learn to become a river guide. And so I thought I would do that for just a couple of years to get the experience, but 16 years later I decided to uh, give it up. But uh, that was a great experience and I learned a lot and I had good trainers and it was a lot of fun. He took us down to Grizzly Creek on the spectacular 12.5 mile gorge called Glenwood Canyon where the elegant highway system winds like a ribbon alongside the Colorado River through the mountains that make up the canyon. Years ago I did a guided trip on the what's called the Shoshone stretch on the Colorado River here and it's just up and around the corner where we can't see and I was assigned a bunch of gentlemen and in the beginning we like to get our people to relax because they can be a bit nervous. So I asked the first gentleman what his name was and uh, I can't remember his name but he said he was a lawyer and I said oh okay that must be an interesting job and he said yes and I went to the next person asked him his name and what he did he said oh I'm a lawyer too and I said oh my gosh that's so much for the lawyer jokes and uh, then I went along and asked everybody else the other three or four men in my group if they were all lawyers too and they all said yes and I just about fell over and I thought oh my gosh I'm about to take five or six lawyers down the most intense section of this daily stretch through the on the Colorado and uh, I hope I don't get sued or anything like that and they all got a big laugh out of it but as it turned out they were a bunch of very nice gentlemen and we got a good line what's called a good line in the water and we hit the rapids just right and at the time they were about class four which is a fairly intense set of rapids in this business and uh, I didn't dump anybody I didn't get sued and all was well and we all got to have a good laugh and and uh, had a good day it was a good time I also taught skiing uh, and got some experience doing that I taught professionally uh, for 25 years my first 16 years were at a place uh, called Ski Sunlight in Glenwood Springs uh, and then I went to uh, an area known as Beaver Creek near Vail and I taught there for nine years and stopped that in 2002, I guess it was, so I could uh, stay focused on my school. Here in Glenwood I happened also to be a, a lifeguard from 1976 from, from that till 1978, so I was a guard for two years as well. So all these things gave me experience I could uh, put under my belt uh, relating to my field. As it happens, we're recording right here in the beautiful Hotel Colorado. I understand you spent some time here in the past. Well, this is where I started my first school. In the basement area, there is a particular wing that used to have a health club. And uh, I wound up starting to teach here in 1986 and uh, taught at that place for nearly 28 years before I wound up going to another location. The ultimate objective of the skilled disciple of martial arts is to obtain victory without combat, but once engaged, he must win against all odds and any cost. Huang Qi
In the martial arts, the lineage of a person's training and the influences of instructor and school are a really important matter. It's about the quality of what's being handed down. Mr. Mabel's been trained by some of the best martial artists and fighters in America. Like many, he brought experience in another martial art to his Tong Sudo training. Tong Sudo is an art form, it's not a sport. I've been training and teaching for nearly 47 years. The number one reason people get involved in a martial arts school is to learn to protect themselves. There's all different kinds of martial arts. There are hard styles, what are known as hard styles, like what I do, uh, styles from Japan, Okinawa, uh, uh, Korea. But there are soft styles. Uh, people might uh, think of your various kung fu styles that move in a very rounded type of way, but they're very powerful and very dynamic. And, uh, and their techniques can well be used for self-defense also. I thought it would be a good idea to learn some moves to protect myself and I didn't know much about martial art at the time, I was just a young boy. So I involved myself in a local judo class in a town I used to live in in New Jersey and studied for a year and then I moved from New Jersey to Maryland and continued my training under a well-known instructor uh, just outside of Washington. And then one night I went to a karate testing and there was a particular focus about the karate test that I really enjoyed. Judo was wonderful and I had at the time one of the finest judo players in the country teaching me. Otherwise I enjoyed the karate and I, I decided it, it fit my, my psyche and the way I thought about things and the precision of it, the focus of it, the concentration. And that was in September of 1970 and I've been doing it ever since. At the time, I didn't know the differences between karate styles, so I happened to be witnessing what was known as Tang Su Do. That's my main art form. I've studied other styles as well, but as far as uh, knowing what I was doing, I really didn't at the time because I had never seen a karate class before. So I didn't know the particular style, didn't know a lot about it at the time. I just knew that I wanted to do it, and it just happened to be uh, a Tang Su Do school. Years ago, when I came out here and started teaching, for some years I was organizationless and uh, it was up to me to teach my students and use the knowledge I had and uh, for the time I didn't have my own instructor. One of them that I was involved in was known as the Chuck Norris System or United Fighting Arts Federation led by Chuck Norris who a great many people are familiar with. I met Mr. Johnson uh, through Mr. Norris years ago. One day I saw an article about the Chuck Norris system, the United Fighting Arts Federation in Black Belt Magazine. And it seemed to fit my way of thinking as far as what I wanted to do with my students and the discipline of it, etc. So I wrote a letter to Mr. Norris's system and long story short, I was accepted into his system. The person who came out to look over my school for Mr. Norris happened to be Master Dick Douglas, who wound up being my personal instructor. So for a time I was involved in the Chuck Norris system and I was very proud to be one of his black belts for the time being. As time went by there were some organizational changes and it led me to the present position I have as president of the Western Tung Sudo Federation. I was honored to speak with Master Pat Johnson who is originally a native of Niagara Falls, New York. He told me about some of the main influences on Tung Sudo as it developed in America including stories of the early days with Chuck Norris and their formidable association. Tang Soo Do was originally the Korean style of martial arts. You can see immediately what the difference is with the fighters by the way they stand. And generally, you could tell someone who has been trained in that country. However, what has happened, and Chuck Norris was the leader of this, there is now an American style after World War II because Chuck Norris did not have any high-ranking Korean instructors on the West Coast. He started to train with the Japanese and in doing so, he developed a very, very unique style. One day I saw Chuck Norris at a tournament in New York and he said to me one day, he watched me fight, he said, I think that if you should ever come to California, we could work really well together. So I upped and I caught a Greyhound bus, came to California and said to Chuck, I'm here. And it started with the fighting team. 
when we were going to have a tournament, a big tournament was coming up, we got all of the black belts. Sometimes there were 25 or 30 of Chuck's black belts. And we had a round robin tournament. And the five guys who won the most, those were the five guys who were going to be on the team. And the next person down was going to be the backup just in case someone got hurt. I won all of these every time we did these. So I was the captain of the team. And we won, I believe, something like 58 or 59 consecutive championship team titles. That's basically our roots. That's where we came from. As you look at black belts like Mr. Mabel, how have you influenced them? What I have tried to do is to have them know the respect that I have and I would like them to have for the martial arts. And I can't expect them to do something or be something that I am not willing to be. I don't do what I do in the martial arts for recognition. I'm trying to pay back what the martial arts have done for me. So I have some things that I'm extremely proud of that we have accomplished. I've tried to do my best to always present the martial arts in their most positive light. Well, I'm, I'm very proud to have been one of the foundation stones because there have been a lot of them who have contributed, whatever it takes, which is one of my great sayings at, uh, at all times. I wound up staying with Pat Johnson and uh, Dick Douglas. Uh, I wound up staying with Master Douglas because I trained mainly under him, but I did get great instruction from Mr. Johnson as well. Mr. Johnson and I are still good friends, and uh, they were all good friends when they trained together, and uh, uh, so through Master Norris I met these other two people, and they've been very influential in my training through the years. So when I was taught by them, uh, they were fighters by nature, and so I learned a lot about sparring and fighting from them, and also a lot about street technique and survival as well. Uh, of course, Master Douglas passed away in 2006, and this is when I took over his position as the president of the Western Tungsido Federation, which he founded in 1998. I met Brian at the same time Mr. Douglas did. Mr. Douglas didn't want to just turn out a black belt just for the sake of a black belt. He was very interested in promoting the art, Kung Sudo, and keeping it alive. And so because of that, before he let me test my black belt, he made me commit to a lifetime of training and perpetuating the art. Because of our influence with Mr. Norris coming from the West Coast and Brian coming from the East Coast, Brian was able to bring a lot of the philosophy of Kung Sudo with him being taught by a lot of the old masters that actually immigrated from Korea to the East Coast. So for me, that's been a, a blessing because that's been a part of the martial arts that I have learned from him. Not only punching and kicking that I learned from Mr. Norris and on down the line through Mr. Douglas, but, but now Brian brings a lot of the, of the philosophy and spiritual side into the organization. We're going to show you what we call one-step sparring. It's a formal application of a punch and block or defensive situation where one partner punches and the other does any number of uh, blocks, uh, strikes, whatever, to show that they can defend themselves. And this is Mr. Gordon Shacoin. He's a second degree black belt uh, with our school. And this is Kuba Bartnik, who is a first degree black belt in Tong Sudo. And they'll demonstrate uh, just a few things for you here. Sparring is uh, throwing blocks and kicks and punches at your opponent to score points. You're, it's like boxers that spar together before a, a regular boxing match. It's all freestyle. We have choreographed movements. We have some basic motions that we teach everybody. But then after a while it becomes more freestyle. You do what comes to mind and you do techniques that work best for you. Uh, some things that would work well for me might not work well for you. Anyway, when you do anything with a partner, you're technically sparring with them to uh, work on your technique and have a have a partner to help you. You learn control so that if you strike a target it's very light as far as non-contact to light sparring. Then there's full contact where there's no you're not holding back you're trying to knock out your opponent. But uh, in a lot of tournaments you, they don't allow anything below the waist because they don't want any joint checking at the knees or ankles or groin shots or whatever but sweeps can be allowed depending on the level. Uh, that varies from tournament to tournament. Judo is well known for sweeping, for example. 
and uh, toppling somebody and destroying their base of support and balance so that you can manipulate them. I've got a bunch of good fighters and uh, my goal is to make, uh, help them get better than me. Everybody's different in that way. People take fighting differently. Uh, some are very aggressive, some are very defensive, and some are kind of in between. Hi, my name is Gordon Chacoin. I've been with Brian Mabel Karate a little over 20 years. I came from a different um, uh, Hapkido background, so I was able to bring some things to the school, also in Korean. But what I really liked and what still continue 20 years later with the Tung Sudo uh, School with Brian Mabel is the preciseness of technique. The execution of simplicity, the um, lack of excess movement so that everything is perfected. People teach themselves, of course. I'm just there to share the knowledge and to help them along. Concentrate your power. Focus. Remember, each form has its own time and speed to be done or performed, and you find that out more and more when you perfect your techniques taking the correct amount of time for each one, etc. We can choose to be really slow, we can go really fast, okay? The other guy, he sees your back turned and he's coming at you. So there's that sense of urgency to move right away, isn't there? Yes, sir. Okay. Why is it that you decided to start your own school? You could have taught for other people. Well, when I was teaching for the college years ago, for Colorado Mountain College, I, of course, was the only instructor in the class, so I had a lot of students and just one of me. and. Uh, it made me think a lot about how to teach a bunch of different people and as they got, when they progressed in their levels as far as belt rank is concerned, I have different levels of, of skill that I needed to work with and I, I in time, uh, learned how to work with everybody as a group. And I just started to continually like the idea of teaching and sharing knowledge. And I decided to stay with it and eventually, you know, opened up my own school. I left the college and decided to try having my own school. One thing that's helped me to stay focused is it, I like to help people and it's a very fun way but great way to help people. In addition to being the owner of Brian Mabel Karate in Glenwood Springs, Mr. Mabel is also the president of the Western Tong Sudo Federation or WTSDF. It's a membership of Tong Sudo black belts in affiliated southwestern U.S. schools in Colorado, Nevada and Utah who associate under this mission statement. The Western Tong Sudo Federation has been founded for the purpose of instilling discipline and respect in all its members who are willing to endure the sacrifices required to obtain the rank of black belt. The Western Tong Sudo Federation was conceived by uh, my late instructor, Mr. Uh, Dick Douglas in 1998. And he was the president, I was the executive vice president and we had a few other people who were on our board of directors uh, secretary, treasurer, etc. Being the president of the Western Tung Sudo Federation means, of course, I have to keep all the schools uh, up to date on what we're doing, which means I travel on occasion to each one of these schools and oversee a testing, for example, to see how they test and to make sure our standards are kept upright and, uh, and of course, our conventions we have every four months. It's, it's my responsibility to run the organization as well as I can. The Black Belts do get together and we have a board of directors that does meet and we go over business affairs of the organization, what's happening at the different schools, etc. And typically these meetings are happening uh, at the same time that we get together every four months to have our clinics and testings. The board meeting is one of the first things that happen uh, so we can get the business uh, out of the way, if you will, and then we proceed on with the rest of the day's activities. So it's a big responsibility, and uh, I just hope I'm doing a, a good job. <laughs> Brian Mabel took the helm. He's been our leader, and uh, without his guidance and uh, expertise and knowledge, we wouldn't be where we're at today as an organization. Just great to have such a fantastic leader for us. I teach an art form known as Tung Sudo. It means the art of the knife hand or China hand way. It's mainly based in Korea, but it has roots in China and Okinawa as well. A lot of martial arts for that matter are compromises of uh, different art forms that are 
if you will, blended together. Uh, but otherwise, that's what I teach mainly. With my judo experience, uh, I'm able to incorporate some of that into our self-defense training. Private lessons, group lessons, my classes are typically divided into different skill levels, as in beginner, intermediate, and advanced, and that way I can focus on the needs of each of those different skill levels. On occasion, I'll do a women's self-defense class and help the ladies learn to protect themselves, and uh, uh, so that's, that's one of the other kinds of classes that I do as well. My name is Jill, and I am the parent of two students here. I'm, um, I've been a member of Brian Mabel Karate for two months now. Um, my, my, my kids liked karate so much that I thought I would join them and it would be fun to do it as a family. And um, in the couple months that I've been doing this, I've gained a lot of confidence and I think I feel a lot better about myself going out and knowing that I might be able to protect myself a little bit better. We have what we call a Friday night workout, and that's for people who maybe missed a class during the regular week, um, or it's an extra time, they can put in extra hours uh, for additional training. They can do whatever they want. They can stretch, uh, they can do their forms, uh, their self-defense. I'm usually there to help everybody. Uh, we learn new things. Sometimes as a group, we'll do the same thing together to make a particular focus out of something, like knife defense, or work on our weapons training. So the Friday Night Workout is, uh, is a, a great addition to the regular weekly schedule of classes. The clinics that we participate in mainly are put on by our black belts in our organization. And again, they happen every four months when we can get together. And uh, black belts travel to each of the locations here or uh, in the other two places I mentioned earlier in uh, Las Vegas and uh, Utah. And we have our clinics there for everybody. Members of the school and their families go to Utah every year. Can you tell us more about what takes place there? That's our summer camp. And we look forward to each one of these because it's a lot of fun. And all of our black belts and students who can come from around the country converge in on these different locations. And we invite special guests to teach us here and there. And uh, so the organization is very involved in the uh, training of all of its students, not just each of the different classes underneath the organization heading. Not only do we do karate technique as in forms or weapons training or something like that, we also learn about outdoor survival relating to maybe making an outdoor emergency shelter. If you're caught in the woods at night and get lost, if you have the right materials, can you make a shelter for yourself? Compass orienteering, uh, learning about a compass and how to guide yourself to safety, hopefully. Um, we also have a rappelling and mountain climbing session to build confidence in people and that's of course a lot of fun and very challenging for some but we usually get a, a good response with that. And we've also gone as far as knife defense and pistol disarmament for people who if you're confronted with someone pointing a pistol at you or at your back uh, there are ways that you can take care of that situation but that's very special training. We work on our kicks, our punches, uh, the typical things that you might see us do in our schools. And we're just outdoors doing them up in the mountains in Utah, and it uh, makes for a nice scene to practice outdoors. Back in Glenwood, Mr. Mabel showed us more of the stunning sights and sounds of that community. This is one of two main rivers in the Glenwood area. I used to commercially raft as a guide years ago. It's called the Roaring Fork River, and it follows down through Glenwood Springs and joins the Colorado at the confluence of Two Rivers Park. This is a nice trip because it's more picturesque in ways than the Colorado. It winds and turns and has a lot of wildlife you can see, including a blue heron rookery, and you see other rafting guides and their people coming down, fishermen. It's a, it's a very active river in the spring, summer, and fall and uh, it was one of my uh, better trips I really enjoyed taking. Being out in nature, that's part of it. You know, favorite things, I do like to work out. I've been uh, exercising a long time as far as that's concerned. Other things I like to do, I like to walk. I like to go rafting with my friends. Outdoor activities like that that are relative to living here. 
As we made our way downtown, we stopped at an historical landmark to hear about special times there. This is Strawberry Park. There's an event here each year called Strawberry Days. And it's the oldest celebrated event in the state. And it commemorates a strawberry harvest they used to have years ago. They don't do, they don't do the strawberries anymore, but they kept the parade going. Glenwood proper is about 9,000 plus people. And on a good day when everybody comes, it swells to about 20,000 or so people. And I also understand that there was a picnic held in your honor a few years ago. Can you tell us about that? Oh, that was a surprise my students put on for me. It was an appreciation uh, barbecue, if you will, to, uh, just let the, to just let me know that the students appreciated the, the class and the training that they've received, and, uh, and it really humbled me a lot and uh, made me feel good. The family feeling in the school is very evident. It creates a bond between all of us, which is nice. We're all there training for the same reasons and learning the same techniques, but yet we're learning in different ways. So that kind of helps to keep the atmosphere a bit loose, but we take our training very seriously. We have enough of the discipline in the class and the use of language as in the Korean language to describe some of the things that we do to, to respect the martial art. So when we get in there and, and line up, uh, it's, it's all business for the time that we're there. But the family feeling helps people to feel that they're welcome in the class, and they really appreciate that. Hello, my name is Pamela Whittington, and I live in Glenwood Springs, Colorado. My reason for joining karate is because I wanted to find something to give me a physical conditioning, but also to learn something, not just to lift weights, to, to do jazzercise and stuff, but it meant something that I could take with me. At age 53, I achieved my first degree black belt, and at 55, I achieved my second degree black belt. So it was quite a phenomenal experience. And you know, martial arts is not just a simple matter of training. It's a cool experience and then you become good friends and good family because we're not there to beat up on each other and hurt each other. We're there to practice, to learn and, and try to develop some skills to protect ourselves, protect our friends or family. I have several people who are, several families I should say, um, that I've taught and who are still with me for after a long time. And I have taught people who were young and they grew up and they got married and had kids and got their kids involved in the class. So it, it dates me a little bit. <laughs> the rewards are good. I like to see their progress and their look on their face when they get better. And, and uh, I, you know, it makes me feel good that I had a part of that. When people get better, you can see that they can feel it. They can see it, they can sense it. And, uh, and their skills are getting better, and, uh, and I'm just glad I had a, a part in that to help them. I start my kids at seven years old, so I do have them from seven on up to adult age. My name is Grace. What I like about Brian Mabel is he teaches a lot, and he's a really good teacher. And... And that's it. People in your school, especially your black belts, also help teach. How do you prepare teachers? You teach martial arts, but how do you also prepare them to teach others? Well, I have classes on that sometimes, but uh, most of their training happens in class where I can see what they're doing. I direct them as far as what I want them to do with a certain group level. And so when I am teaching certain people over in the corner, I'm keeping my eye on what my black belts are teaching over in the next corner. And if they need to be brushed up a little bit, I'll just walk over and gently add a few footnotes uh, to their teaching, and then I'll walk back to my students. So a lot of it is hands-on and with me directly uh, there in the room to teach them myself in case people need it. Hello, my name is Eric Krauth and I have been um, in Mr. Mabel's studio for seven years now. Um, I did karate when I was in Nebraska and then we moved here and we were looking for a karate um, team so we actually um, uh, sat in in a karate lesson and I liked it so I moved in here 
And I, what, one of the things that I really like about Mr. Mabel's karate is we get we learn um, discipline, respect for each other, and we get motions like well done. Um, if we don't do something right, he um, tells us what we need to fix until it's per, um, perfected and it's like nice. We learn how to make torque into our movements and just we get to practice a lot and we know how to defend ourselves. That I've been here almost 41 years, all the things that I've done have worked out for me. It felt good and I just kept on going, doing what I was doing because it felt right and I don't feel the need to change anything at the moment. I feel like I'm in my place, I have a good school, I have good students. I feel like my place is here so this is where I'm going to be. Tell us about one of your favorite places to go in Glenwood. Well, there's one in particular known as the Daily Bread and Cafe on, in downtown Glenwood. And uh, by chance, it happens to be owned by a couple of students of mine, Mark and Joanna Bartnick. They've owned and operated the place for a long time, and they're good friends of mine as well. And so I tend to frequent their uh, establishment. And uh, so they, they know my face real well over there. Uh, I can't frankly remember exactly how they got involved. I think she knew that John, the previous owners, were involved, uh, was involved in the class. Well, our son wanted to do it since very early on, and finally Mr. Mabel allowed him in a class at the age six and a half, and I simply got jealous seeing how much fun he's having. Uh, what we've seen is it gives them more self-pride, confidence, in all different aspects, in class and also outside class. There's more of a self-confidence, um, even it correlates with football, with the hand movement, and you can see that attribute also with skiing, but it's more of a sense of balance, uh, coordination, and we have seen that with our kids. Well, of course, we're very proud. It, it took a lot of time and a lot of effort. Uh, some encouraging, however, for the most part, they just really wanted to do that themselves. My name is Kua Bartnik. Um, I've been doing karate for about six years now. Um, it's been a big part of my life. Since I joined, I thought, oh my gosh, this is so cool, finally something I really like and I've kept up with it and it's been so fun. Also I've learned how to do many motions and I get to go to tournaments and when you go to tournaments you can qualify for nationals and visit other places. So karate can help you and influence you in so many different ways. Mr. Mabel is a great teacher. He's encouraging. He, he just likes to help out a lot. And, for my, when I went for my black belt, he put in so much more extra time for me and it was just so great. It is nice to do something with the kids. And instead of them sitting home on the computer and lollygagging all of the time. My name is Gabby Bartnick and I do karate and I love it. I learned how to defend myself. I think it definitely has changed my life because I feel like I know how to fight off someone and not just guess. I know how to. I actually don't just sit around and play on my iPhone or iPad. I actually get up, get active, and do something. Mr. Mabel is pretty special to us. You know, he's like a family member, and and gosh, he remembers our kids since they were very little. So he is part of their lives and he watches them growing up too and he's a just a big 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 part of it and I do believe that if it wasn't for Mr. Mabel and Karate they would be a very different kids in terms of focus and discipline and just achieving their goals. And they're still at it. How would you say that studying martial arts has influenced your life? Well, it's helped me to stay focused and disciplined in what I do. Uh, my life has been a very physically active one, uh, with the skiing, of course, and the martial arts, or rather the uh, rafting. And, uh, and uh, it, it's helped me to 
be a calmer person. Uh, it helps me to keep my ego in check. Um, uh, it's just helped me a lot in a lot of different ways. Mr. Mabel shows us that Tang Soo Do is a process, not an event. And this includes giving back to help other students improve. It's not just the block and the kick and the punch. Those are really just the vehicle in which you learn about all the good things about martial art training. And uh, so they take away the feeling that they, uh, the I can attitude, if you will, and they can apply that to other areas of their life other than just their martial arts. Hi, my name is Grant. You are Brian Mabel. I've learned so many things, like determination and to, to not give up and having self-confidence and doing things I've never done before and getting out of my comfort zone. And we work on a whole bunch of different kinds of things, so that's really fun. And he's a good teacher. The culture that Mr. Mabel instills in his students is the same culture that Mr. Douglas handed down to Mr. Mabel. The discipline, the focus, the correct martial art etiquette is very big for our group and I think it needs to be that way. And for Mr. Mabel it was never about promoting somebody to the next level unless they were ready. He sticks with that philosophy and I respect that. I expect a lot out of my people, kind of like Mr. Mabel expects a lot out of his black belts. And Mr. Mabel also personifies that. I would hope that they would learn good discipline they could apply to their lives, to not be afraid of problems, turning the word problem into challenge to overcome, uh, setting goals and knocking down the barriers for whatever they want in life, and uh, uh, you know these kinds of things that you can take from the class, these mental things, which is important. Um, of course, a better understanding of how to protect themselves, which is good because that raises your confidence a lot in surviving a situation, hopefully. Um, there are many variables as far as that subject is concerned. But overall, just taking from the class a, a heightened awareness about yourself as a human being. What contribution does studying karate make to the larger community? Oh, that's a good question. I think it helps one way, in one way, to help people to be better people, to, to be courteous to other people, to be respectful, uh, to contribute to society in a positive type of way. Uh, and all of these things can be learned through martial art training. So uh, that way uh, they're, they're able, to, again, to take their karate outside of class and apply it in positive ways towards, uh, towards society. Years ago, there was a, an award ceremony given out to, I believe, 26 people in the community who were outstanding in their field that have contributed in, in real positive ways to their community. And there were all kinds of uh, people represented from professionals, doctors, to sports people who were professional athletes and their contributions to their community. I was honored to be one of the winners of the award because of training and teaching martial arts for a long time, teaching children for example, teaching kids to be good people and uh, contributing in that way. So I was, I was very honored to, to win one of those awards. I've had parents bring me their children to learn to focus better. Uh, so that they can uh, concentrate on their homework and I've had uh, many stories through the years of parents telling me that their, uh, the grades of their kids has gone up and almost through the ceiling, uh, if not through the ceiling, which they're really proud to see. Uh, I've had uh, parents bring me children with ADHD uh, issues relating to focus and concentration. So there are different reasons that you can train. Uh, some people like to train mainly for self-defense. Tang Soo Do is an art form, it's not a sport. So there's a focus on uh, traditional movements as well as up-to-date movements that can help you in the street. So there are various reasons that people want to train. Most of us have taken at least five years to actually uh, achieve the rank of black belt in the Western Tongue Federation and in the uh, organizations past 
with Mr. Johnson and Mr. Norris, it has not been an easy thing to get. And so because of time involved, relationships are developed and people become a part of the fabric of your life. Oh my gosh, this is a lifetime commitment because you're needed. What you have to give now from now on is, is huge because you're empowering other people. You're not just teaching an exercise class. You're empowering them to take care of themselves and give them confidence and it changes your life in so many ways. Just like the young kids, it changes their studying habits with their focus, their intent, because they are becoming something as an individual as well as learning their, their studies at the same time. Martial arts is a powerful tool for any age. Hi, I'm Avery Justice. I've been with the studio for about eight years now. And what I've learned here is that working on making it perfect, not really on street fighting like most schools. They teach what to do in real street fights. That's what we do too. But it's more on focusing on technique and how to make it perfect, how to perform it well, and execute of a hit with everything. I personally have enjoyed it. It's been a good exercise, good discipline, and it keeps your heart rate up. You leave feeling like you've accomplished something. Whatever they go for, hopefully they have good reason with a good attitude to achieve their goals. Uh, for example, black belt is a coveted goal in this business, and uh, in our school we do not hand out rank at all. Uh, we like to try to teach our students that you should be deserving of your rank, that you put in the time to prepare yourself fully, uh, uh, trained well enough and hard enough for your tests, whether it be gold belt or black belt. Um, we like to think of the black belt as the end of the beginning. That means that you're very good at your basics or your fundamentals. And then, uh, then the fun starts, if you will, as far as uh, learning more advanced uh, techniques after you achieve the black belt. The black belt is, is something that you become. It's not something that you get just because you paid X amount of money for a, a piece of material around your waist. We don't do that. So even though we do have rank, we treat it very carefully and let people know that for whatever rank, uh, using this again rank as a, uh, as a goal for somebody, that you do want to prepare for it and uh, represent your level of skill well. And not just think of it as a belt chase just to get to black belt. It's a continual life process that Mr. Mabel's been working on his entire life. He instills this in his students, the lifelong perfection of technique. I find that in talking with the other students and in watching them grow into becoming a black belt, they start to understand what perfection of technique means. They bring it inside of them, and so that when they bring it out here in the dojo, not only just to get their black belt status, but they find out it applies to everything else that they do in life. The perfection of technique is the control in oneself. It is a lifelong perfection. It's just always there, and that's why I'm still here. You will be tired. That means you did it right. As part of the process for getting a black belt, a student has to break a board. How do you train them to do that? Schools treat this differently. Uh, some schools don't break at all. Uh, other schools break a lot. The thought behind breaking is to test your focus and your concentration and your skill level. You can't just hit blindly at a piece of wood or several boards stacked together or even cinder block for that matter and hope for the best. You have to, it takes years of training, mental training, to understand what a break is before you finally do it. And then you practice uh, carefully, of course, your positioning of your foot or your hand, or your wrist, whatever, otherwise you could hurt yourself. But the idea behind it is to challenge the testing candidate or someone in a demonstration who, who might show breaking in a demonstration their ability to focus and follow through with their technique so they can make a break successful. And of course when you break something it makes you feel good and uh, sometimes not all breaks are successful. Uh, but you try your best and you just keep, continue to teach yourself uh, to uh, make your breaks all successful after a while. Hi, my name is Kaylee Justice. Um, I'm a first degree red and I'm testing for my black belt in March. I've been doing this for about seven years and I really learned a lot. 
I asked Kaylee, what's the best part of studying martial arts? Um, I just, I don't know, just, it's, it's fun and makes you work hard. I asked her whether breaking boards is more mental or physical. It's both. Um, for like, when you get in the upper ranks, breaking wood, I mean, if you have a mindset that you can't do it, then chances are you can't, but it also takes physical because you have to have the right technique to do it. So Kaylee, how do you feel? I feel excited. This has been a real gem for the town. It's been quite the attraction in the past several years. Well, the first thing I felt, I think, when I first moved here years ago was I felt the smallness of the town. It was kind of tucked at the bottom of these three large mountain ranges and it had a more relaxed feel to it, which I really liked a lot. I was drawn to that and uh, it wasn't hard to meet people. There are people here who have been here since I've been here, you know, and we all feel the same kind of thing about living here. We, this is just a great place to live. It's beautiful. It has outdoor activities and there's a lot of history around here as well. I just felt that when I drove over the bridge in town years ago in my Volkswagen, I, I could feel right away that I was getting into something good. It's a very homey, family type of feel. Town, everybody knows everybody. The natural beauty also is very attractive here. There's a natural attractiveness of the Roaring Fork Valley that people love around here and uh, it's a more relaxed type of community, let's say against a city like Detroit or New York City or something. And uh, it's a fun place to live. There's lots to do here, but I've made some good friends here as well. And after I graduated from college years ago here, some of the people I went to school with are still here as well. I've known a number of people to move back to Glenwood because they missed it that much. A lot of people I know are very physically active for outdoor activities and they miss that part of it and they miss the, the, the down-to-earth feeling that the valley has and uh, it just makes you feel good inside. Can you tell us what it takes to get a ninth degree black belt? A lot of years of training. That's, I would start off by saying that and then next I would say that the rules and regulations, if you will, from school to school that have rank are different. In our particular experience, in my, in my organization, um, we uh, typically you would test for the next highest black belt level. There's different things that you do and then you would wait for several years before you go for the next level. The idea is to discipline the student, to uh, have them participate in an organization possibly teaching. They might be an officer of the organization. These things weigh into being promoted as well. So it's not only a physical test and typically uh, it's a few years before you attain your first degree black belt, let's say. And then a lot of schools will follow a schedule where it's two years to get your second degree black, etc., etc. It's just been a pleasure to be able to work by his side. Brian is a great friend, one of my best friends, and so I really enjoy working with him and uh, being directed by him in this work of promoting and moving forward the art of Tung Soo Do. What's been important to you about becoming a black belt? It was a challenge I saw that I knew I could do. I could see that it was a difficult thing to achieve, but I didn't let that put fear in my mind. I, I wanted to show myself that I could take on a challenging goal, uh, like attaining a black belt, and, and uh, win that for myself, be deserving of wearing a black belt. So there's a lot of energy, mentally and physically, that's put into this kind of award, and uh, you don't want to take it lightly. And so I took it on as a challenge and I was successful and I kept being successful through my ranks and my skills. It's been a very rewarding experience for me overall. Coming to Glenwood was a real treat for me years ago. First of all, I'd never been west of the Mississippi and I wanted to come out here somewhere to go to school and I was hoping it would be Colorado. It turned out that it 
did happen to be that way, and uh, I'm glad that I landed in this town because I really enjoyed it. The training that I've been involved in has helped me in a lot of ways, and I'm just glad that I have lived in a community that's let me share that information with people. And uh, through the college and through my own school, and that's meant a lot to me. And uh, it's been a long time since I started teaching, and I still love to teach, and I imagine I'll be doing it for the foreseeable future. So we leave Glenwood Springs and Brian Mabel with a strong impression that martial arts can change lives, going way beyond kicks or punches. It's about going after what you want, and about people, driving each other to improve and to achieve goals with benefits at many levels. And in the end, it's about teachers who invest their time to make a difference. Mr. Mabel, thank you very much for spending time with us today. You're welcome. What questions should we ask while we're at the Daily Bread? Yeah, really. <laughs> Is the food good? <laughs> You're shy kicking the board, not Mr. Shikoin. Just like that. <laughs> Those questions, um, just for the sake of asking, are you going to ask every single one of them or have you kind of synopsized? I was going to say because that's a lot of the questions that you yes. put down there. So we'd be here for a long time. Okay. Um, Mr. Bartnick. Okay. Um, eventually what I'd like you to do is assist Kaylee. The more she gets used to you, you know, it's going to be, it's going to help her quite a lot, as you know. So you can help her and attack her for her one steps and three steps. And I'll work with her and show her the next one. Okay? Um, very good. Did you say all the right things? Yes. Good. I was listening to you. One false thing from you and you're in trouble. Tell Brian I, I said this. It has been entirely too long. You want to say anything to Mr. Mabel? No. Okay. 